Yeah, it's one thing that wasn't mentioned in the Colin Samir interview. This episode is insane. We spoke to Angus Parker, the man behind Ali Abdal's YouTube channel that makes 4.7 million a year with a business strategy that very few people know about. And he very generously shared the whole thing with us. So their three step strategy for growing on YouTube to almost 5 million subscribers, how they've grown their revenue from $2.27 in 2017 to $5 million this year. I think we did around 70, 80K in the first like 24 hours. And it's just mad. The one email that he sent that changed his life, complete revenue breakdown. And to be honest, it's even less than that now because Ali's kind of, there was a period we're revealing the secrets now. There is so much value in here. I really hope you enjoy it. If you do, please subscribe for more. Let me know what you think and let's dive in. Angus, thank you so much for joining me no on Creator Playbooks. Pleasure to be here. This is a crazy job. This is a dream job. Mm. Um, how on earth do you end up uh, in this position? Mm. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, it's somewhat, somewhat accidental, I guess. Um, but it started, I sent Ali a... Well, I left university in summer of 2019 um, and I was looking to get into some sort of journalism or broadcasting role because that's what I was kind of into at university. I didn't actually study that. And then January 2020, I emailed Ali being like, noticed you're kind of expanding. He was just, just shy of half a million subscribers at that point. He just hired an editor and I'd seen that application, the, the job application advert, sorry, for the editor. And I was like, I can't edit black and write. Do you need help with research and writing um and he was like oh i'm right. just about to start looking for that role so yeah why not um which is a, a good trait that he has is he's kind of open to just being like why not yeah try out kind of thing yeah um so yeah started doing that for like two three days a week just doing research i remember doing research for sort of early stage covid videos sally was still doing a bit of medical stuff and covid was just starting around january february time um and then yeah, it just kind of grew from there. So it went from sort of two or three days a week. And then when COVID hit, I had a couple of other freelance gigs, which just sort of ended overnight. Um, and so it went up to sort of four days a week, then five days a week, and then kind of full time from basically April 2020 onwards. Um, and then April, I taught myself how to edit. So I started editing videos on the main channel as well. And then, you know, throughout 2020, I was living in Cambridge and Ali was also there. So when restrictions allowed, we were able to kind of work together. Um, and throughout 2020, it was just three, four of us. And I was basically just doing kind of a generalist, just doing everything to help Ali publish videos, um, and make courses. And yeah, it kind of grew from there, but I don't know how much detail you want to go yeah, to. Yeah. I mean, like, so it's, it's super interesting. Cause like, in a way, I guess the best jobs aren't advertised. No. Um, yeah. were you interested in this whole kind of create a business? What was the, what was the, what was the, the, the thought process? Or you just like Ali? No, not, not, not really. Um, no, sorry, not really into creative business. I did like Ali. <laughs> yeah. um, no, it was, it was more, I could just see an opportunity um, just to do some freelance work, essentially. Uh -huh. Like I didn't necessarily see that there was a, an avenue for helping Ali further down the line and it would turn into a multi-million pound business. I think even then, like it wasn't necessarily even it's just grown so much in the last three years not not our business but like this whole space mm -hmm. i think even then it wasn't even seen as sort of that much of an opportunity unless yeah. you were really in the bubble um and so no i didn't i didn't necessarily see it like that at all uh but it was only when it started to get traction and then skillshare started to take off and the the money started to just be silly um that it was like actually this is a this is a thing and it's not just writing videos for a youtuber yeah and with all those little tasks that you're picking up, mm. are you actively seeking them out and saying like, Ali, can I help with the video editing? Can I help this, the, with, with the core sales, with the um, putting together these extra things outside of your initial role? Or mm. is he just throwing random stuff at you? It was a bit of both. Uh, in the early stages, very much the latter, like he was just throwing random stuff at me. Um, and then, yeah, like he would sort of say, can we turn... So we'd, we'd seen, seen like the studying videos on YouTube had done really well. So he was like, can we turn that into a studying class from Skillshare? And so I kind of put that together and that went out in April. And that was the thing that really started to skyrocket things. Um, but yeah, it was kind of a bit of both, to be honest. Yeah. And let's talk about that 
pendulum swinging moment. Mm. How does that come to be? Does Skillshare reach out to you? Do you hear that you can make money on Skillshare? Yeah, so Ali What's had spoken to Thomas Frank in like the autumn of the previous year mm -hmm. and had created a editing class, still on there. Like the first class we put out on Skillshare was a Final Cut editing one. Came out before I joined. So that had been on Skillshare. That was generating about two or three K a month. Mm -hmm. I think at that stage, Ali was like, oh, this is insane. Like we've got this course that I've made and it's just generating money. Um, and so we got to a point where we knew other creators had sort of multiple courses on Skillshare and we knew the studying thing was something which students can access because you can, you could access Skillshare for free. Mm -hmm. And Ali's always been somewhat hesitant to monetize students in any way because of the fact that students don't have money. Yeah. Um, so he was just like, let's create a self, like the ultimate guide to studying. And so we put that out in kind of, um, April, 2020, um, and from so April 2020, it sort of started to take off. I think it made about 29,000 Skillshare in April. Wow. And then by June, when we released, we released another class at that point. We would put out, I think we put out a course a month at that point. And by June, it would, was up to 60K. And then it generated over 60K for two years straight wow. without wow. too much. We put out a course like every quarter usually. Yeah. Um, and it was at that point, it was just, just crazy. Um, Take, take take us to those moments. What's when? Like when do you see these numbers? Are you like refreshing as soon as the thing goes out? Or what? that's the thing with, with, with Skillshare. It's sort of like it only you only see it once a month. Mm -hmm. So it only updates like once a month. So we can't like necessarily keep track of it. Sort of as things go out, that sort of came later on with our own courses. But what it what it did do was made us think, oh, this is really good. But ultimately, Skillshare is not a platform that we own. And yeah. suddenly, like eighty to ninety percent of the business revenue was coming through this platform that we have no control over. Yeah. Um, so it did make us think, okay, we need to actually think of creating our own course and, and having our own sort of IP yeah. um, because we can control that to a, to a greater extent than Skillshare because they could have, you know, just shut down overnight. We have no control over that. Yeah. Um, Why are you thinking that though? Because th is there anything in particular that just spurs that thought or you're just you're just thinking like we want to expand, take on people. This is This is like... A, re a risky business, we're not diversified. Yeah, I, I think it's something that creators don't think about enough in terms of, mo I mean, any platform that a creator grows on, they don't own that audience. Mm -hmm. Like any any platform. The only way you can do that is by growing an email list. Yeah. Um, but YouTube, TikTok, Facebook, whatever, Snapchat, Instagram, whatever it is, that could just disappear overnight. Mm -hmm. And so we were constantly thinking, same with Skillshare, we were constantly thinking like, how can we make sure that we de-risk it to such an extent that we can expand? Um, and the initial, eventually that will be, how can we de-risk it away from Ali being like the key point of failure in the business? But at that point it was Skillshare is like a key point of failure because if that disappears, then the whole business disappears. And at that point it didn't matter too much. I say it didn't matter, but like it was only sort of two or three of our lives that would have been, would have been affected, yeah. but now it's a m m much bigger team. And so, um, yeah, we, we were basically thinking, how can we create our own stuff so that we are, yeah, we do have control over it. Yeah. And just to be clear, if anyone's listening to this or watching this and they think, oh, I can just create a Skillshare course and mm. I'll be spitting out 60K a month, is that a, re a real thing? Or is it just because it was Ali and it was his audience that was going to these things and yeah. then you're getting yeah. a commission that you're yeah. making that money? No, yeah, no, Skillshare is, I mean, actually now Skillshare's even worse. It makes us around like 20K a month now because they've changed their rates and things like that. But even back then, the reason it did so well was because of the size of his audience, because he'd never kind of pushed a product to that audience before. And it was just like all those things coalescing to me that it was kind of the perfect, perfect mix. Um, but no, if you just make a Skillshare course and try to put it out, you're still gonna struggle as much as, it's like trying to go on YouTube, basically. If you've got no audience to push to it, it's yeah. not like you're gonna magically make money. Yeah, I'll, I'll scrub it off my to-do list. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's talk about part-time YouTuber mm. Academy. Yeah. So how does that idea come to be? Is it's just it, it's from that course, right? What yeah, course yeah, yeah. So essentially, we were thinking about needing to diversify, um, and Ali put out a tweet, um, more or less like three years ago, around this time, three years ago, so August, September, about like, what is stopping people from starting a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. I think it was it was to to be completely we we can be revisionist about it and say, oh, that was all planned. But actually, I think to be fair, it's quite an accidental, innocent tweet of like, what is stopping people from actually starting a YouTube channel? Yeah. Um, and we got loads of responses to that and we were like, actually this could, you know, there, there's something in this, there's a course in this. Um, and so we put it off for a bit 
um, went through various different iterations of stuff that we could do and things like that to help grow the audience more. I kind of joke that just before we planned PTYA, Ali um, changed his mind about four times on wanting to do 100 videos in 100 days mm -hmm. at the end of 2020. Um, and eventually, after a week of going back and forth on that, I went over to his house and we were just like, oh, should we just plan the YouTuber course now? Yeah. And yeah, we sat down, I think it was like the 20th of October, um, planned out the course. And then that was basically all we did for the next few weeks. And we launched the first cohort. We started the first cohort on November the 14th. So it's like three weeks from ideation to actually the first lesson being delivered. Um, and yeah, it was, yeah, crazy. What was crazy? <sighs> the how many people, well, how did, how do you price it and how many people signed up? Yeah, so we, so Thiago Forte and David Perel had kind of convinced Ali that doing it as a live cohort would be worth doing. I think Ali had always been quite hesitant about one, selling stuff and two, doing it live because it's a big effort doing a live cohort. Yeah. I made convinced him that that was a good thing to do. Um, and if it's live, if it's over four weeks, which it was, um, we decided like prices, we were quite conservative. I personally, I think with prices in terms of, um, standard cohort based courses and so i think the prices initially range from about 200 300 dollars for like the lowest package up to 670 dollars for the highest package there were three tiers um and yeah we, we put it out thinking like 10 20 people would sign up and we could sort of validate this idea and maybe support the skillshare revenue a bit um and then yeah within a week 350 people had signed up and it had made about 300k in revenue in <laughs> in the space of about a week which was so, yeah so is that that's basically three times what the business did the year before pretty much yeah in a, in in a couple of weeks a couple of weeks <laughs> in a couple of weeks yeah based off a, a course that we'd put together with sticky notes in Ali's flat it's it mad isn't it it's like yeah. you see those videos of the internet is um internet is beautiful those like not shopify notifications coming through yeah, you yeah. can't even imagine like you can't conceive that there are so many people out there yeah. willing to pay for good knowledge and to learn skills, right? Yeah, again, it came back to the fact that Ali had built up that audience for so long that and offered them nothing like product-wise. And so they were ready to buy, essentially. And yeah, I think he talked about it in the uh, Colin and Samir interview, but it, we were sort of sat on, the, on a Zoom call when we first opened the cohort. And we were like, oh, it's, people are buying. This is cool. Oh, we've hit our 10, 15, oh people are still buying um and the number really did like you know we hit refresh I and mean, it just jumped from 10 20 30 40k and i think uh, as ali mentioned on the other interview i think we did i think we did around 70 80k in the first like 24 hours and it's mm -hmm. just mad yeah completely mad um and yeah. what did you have planned out what, what was the offer there it was like a four-week thing you jump on a, a live call every week and then yeah. you have like some curriculum each week that's a focus yeah, it was actually it was actually kind of even more intense than the last cohort that we just did um, because it was like three sessions a week, um, two hour sessions with Ali, as well as like guest speakers every week as well. So that that cohort was probably the the one that stuck together the most because it was just so intense. Like mm -hmm. every single day there was something going on because yeah. we were so worried slash concerned that people wouldn't get value from it. So we were just like, how much value can we provide? Yeah. Um, and one of the things that we started, that I started doing was like providing feedback on everyone else's videos. And that became a massive like selling point of the course eventually. Um, but again, that four weeks was just mad. And I think it helped again, the fact that most people around the world were in some sort of lockdown. Yeah. And so having that community online suddenly was for, for doing a thing, which for most people is weird, like making videos and having a YouTube channel is unusual. Yeah. And so to have that kind of really close knit community, have that intensity of three sessions a week, that kind of thing, um, it really hit the right note. And yeah, just sort of took the business from, yeah, A to, I don't know, F. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely a, p a point worth making that that period in time was like the genesis of, a, of the cohort based yeah. course because you had everyone at home desperate to meet new people. Yeah. Everyone's got familiar with using Zoom and everyone is like trying to learn something because they've got so much more spare time, right? So yeah. it's the perfect time for that business. Do you think you can, like cohort-based courses are still as relevant today? Is it still a thing that people mm. want to be doing, jumping on Zoom calls? It's an interesting question. Um, 
I obviously we've sort of stopped doing cohorts now um, as of earlier this year. I, I, I think it is, I think it just requires sort of better packaging um, to sort of make it more appealing and to make it fit in with people's lives. I think one one cohort, which I think is doing a really good job of all of this is Ship 30 for 30, yeah, the writing yeah. one. Ticky Bush, yeah. Um, because personally, I think it's because they're packaging it so well of like, people can conceptualize 30 days. Mm -hmm. I think people struggle with conceptualizing like four weeks, six weeks. What does that really mean in my life? Whereas like 30 days, it's just like, oh, that's a month. I know what 30 days is. Yeah. And I think that's why that's continued to do well as other cohort-based courses have perhaps started to struggle. Um, because I think there's a need to think more about how does this work with normal life? Whereas back then it was like, how does it work with remote, everyone being remote? Yeah. And you don't really need to think too hard about that because everyone's on the computer anyway, on Zoom, as you say. Um, so yeah, like I, th I think there probably is a future, but I think it's probably more of a future in creating and developing like strong communities. I think that's probably the next sort of wave of the online creator world is some sort of community era. Yeah. Um, whatever that whatever that means but I, I do think there's kind of great opportunity for that because it can be more async and i think that's kind of what people need now so it fits in with their lives rather than needing to be like live yeah um yeah i worked for a company on deck who oh, yeah, yeah. built their business on cohort-based courses yeah. in that period mm. and even at that time i think there was a realization that if you move to more of a community model an annual model yeah it's a, it's more sustainable yeah. for everyone involved. For um, sure. Because it's, it, it, it's, it's a really intense business to do cohort-based yeah. courses. And the, the other issue is, like, to, to, to your point around sustainability, it's for the last, like, three years, our, like, accounts have just looked, like, you know, flat for a bit and then a massive spike and then goes back down and a massive spike. And it's just, that's fine. It's obviously good when we get the money in, but it's... We, we, we well, I don't know, you want managing the monthly business, recurring revenue. I want, I want a bit of like stability <laughs> to be able to forecast stuff and not have to rely on, um, you know, a hope that the launch goes well, yeah. which is, you know, where we fell down last year. So, yeah. You, you want that good MMR. MMR. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into that a bit <laughs> later. But I think it is worth um, talking about a little bit about your experience then, all those years now of mm. the cohort based course. What makes a really good one? Interesting. Um, I think it starts with having someone who is a and it's very, very basic, but is a good teacher. Mm -hmm. I think some people think, oh, I can do a co-op-based course, that's going to be easy. But actually teaching a group of maybe 100, 200, 300 people is tricky. Mm -hmm. And Ali's just very good at it. He used to teach in real life in his previous business, was like teaching students how to get into medical school. All of that was in person in real life, like seven or eight, nine years ago. And he's just very, very good at that. And I think that's something that potentially people do overlook when they just, they've got an audience, but maybe they're not that charismatic or maybe they need sort of, you know, pre pepping up to be charismatic in any way, but Ali's just naturally very good at that. So I think mm -hmm. that definitely helps. Um, I think the community element is a big part of it. Um, one of the reasons I think co-op based courses were so successful is because they have the element of accountability, which self-serve courses don't have unless you have a community element attached to it. So I think that's another another really big, big thing. Um, and then just kind of over delivering on value. Uh, we're very big now on like creating an offer, which um, instead of Alex from Mosey terms is like Grand Slam offer, like 10x the value of what you're actually pricing it at. And if it's not reaching that threshold, then what can we add to it to make it reach that threshold? So I think that's another kind of, doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, um, uh, it's not what will make a cohort-based course work or not, it's like the offer, but it will, it's what makes a cohort-based course sell. Yeah. It's like, how can you actually make the offer so enticing that, that people think it's a no-brainer? Yeah. Um, so I think those three things are kind of important, what we've learned over the last couple of years. Um, and then delegating effectively basically like we have a full team now even though we're not cohort anymore and we've got like a service-based product there's still i think five six people working on it either in a full-time or part-time capacity mm -hmm. um and so just being able to like manage that team and effectively grow it like that so that you can still deliver on what you've promised yeah what's the highest ticket at the moment it's 4995 for like a 12 month um done with you service so um basically it's the same as our exec package essentially so they've got access to the last cohort but um access to all our courses and then 
there's like 18 members who have weekly office hours so they get opportunity to do that i do an office hours every week ali does a monthly q a there's like mastermind calls there's there's a lot going on yeah um, and it's just 12 months and you get basically sort of on on demand support whenever yeah. you want my mind was blown when i heard that because i think that's the other thing that people most creators get wrong right is they they come and come out and they price something like 200 pounds whereas the real value that you can capture is more yeah. of these kind of numbers the 5k and i get access to all of ali's team mm -hmm. for a year mm -hmm. so how many people is that how many salaries is that like that's a lot of that's a lot of value I'm getting yeah. for five grand. Now, admittedly, that's not accessible for very many people, yeah. but how much of your audience do you convert, do you think, to that um, of Ali's audience? Like, he's got three, four million followers. Yeah, Ali, Ali always likes to say, um, to operate by like the 99-1-1 rule. So like 99% of the content is free, 1% is like paid, and 1% of that 1% will pay for, 1% of the audience will pay for that 1%. And that will pay for everything else. That will pay for all the other free content that we're able to put out. And so that's kind of why we go for the, the premium prices because we know we're targeting that group. We're not, we're not trying to target people who are, you know, who, aren't a, who are able to afford maybe $100, $200 courses but not the $5,000 um, because we want to give the con free content away to those people. So that's kind of how we operate really. 99% of our stuff is, is free. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of like, you selling this course, you don't actually sell it really through YouTube, do you? It's more no. through like other channels, yeah. like your, your Twitter, your email. How does the funnel work for actually selling it? Yeah, so something we've, we don't use paid ads. Um, we didn't use paid ads at all for the last like three or four years. Um, and we've tried to steer clear of YouTube as much as possible, which is kind of ironic. Um, we do a bit of, a bit through YouTube, but if, it, if we do, it's like an integration in a video rather than anything more than that. And we've never really had too much kind of backlash against that. Um, but we purposely don't do it on YouTube because the audience isn't right. So the main, most of our sales come through our email list. So mm -hmm. we build that, we, what well, we used to build those up between cohorts. Um, and we have various different email sequences that help nurture those people. And then we have like a launch sequence when we were doing cohorts. Um, so every, like probably 80, 90% of the, the actual sales come as a result of the email list rather than anything else. And we do a bit of promotion on social media, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn and stuff, not Instagram because Instagram and YouTube audience is quite similar in terms of their propensity to kick up, like make a, make a fuss of something like this that was so expensive and not yeah. targeted at those people. Yeah. Um, and it was interesting. We saw earlier this year, like Yes Theory tried to target their course on YouTube yeah. and that was very instructive because I think like around the same time we launched our one that was 10 times more expensive and got far less backlash. But I think, yeah, they just approached it wrong on a number of different levels. So how would people get on the email list where, it, it, so, is, is this like tweets under Twitter friends? Yes, yeah, so it would be. Like, and is it join the newsletter because you've got a newsletter or is it join a, a purpose, purpose built list for PTYA. Yeah, so there'd be in, certainly in between the cohorts that we'd change all the um, CTAs on the PTYA website to sign up for the email list, the waiting list for like the next cohort. Um, and then in Twitter threads, it might be about YouTube, for example, the CTA would be um, like a five day email sequence mm -hmm. that people can sign up to. Um, we do have Sunday snippets, which is a separate newsletter, um, but we like we don't sell on there either, really. Um, so yeah, it was it's kind of signing up to email sequences uh, that can provide again providing free value yeah. um, uh, as much as possible, and then people get put onto the list for the main cohort, and that's kind of how we grew it over the last couple of years. So is that five is that five sequence email? Is that like an email course, like a, a intro yeah. to YouTube so, or something like yeah, that? Yeah, exactly. Um, over five days, um, and then before each cohort, we had a thirty day email sequence uh, where like day. 25 was usually the day we launched so it's like nurturing people up until the launch yeah that's amazing and i think that's the other thing that people miss with these types of businesses mm -hmm. it's like they say oh ali abdar's making five million a year he just spins up a landing page yeah throws together a, a yeah. bit of copy and uh, presses live and then all this money rolls in it's not it's like this is a highly sophisticated marketing operation yeah probably with people who are like dedicated to email and working on these sequences yeah. and crafting it and making sure it's updated every time. So it's like, this there's is, a lot, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot that on. goes on here. Yeah. How does that, how, um, how has that developed? Yeah. I mean, to be honest, we've, 
like with everything else over the last like three years, a lot of it has been like learnt on the job and we've made a mm. lot of mistakes inadvertently over the last like two or three years where even just sort of, again, mention him again, but like Alex Hormozzi's book last year, reading that and thinking about offers in that way, it's like, oh yeah, we should, I can't, we half did that accidentally. Same with like funnels and stuff like that. We kind of educated ourselves on that last year. And we're like, oh, we were sort of half doing that anyway, but actually this is, there's a playbook for this. Um, and every, it seems like every sort of three to six months, we discover either someone else or another book and we're just like, ah, so this is how you do it properly. And it turns out we, we've probably been doing it like 50% right or 60% right, kind of accidentally. And then we read this stuff and actually educate ourselves a bit. Um, but again, it's kind of learning by doing and then reinforcing with the actual theory, um, which I actually think is quite a good way of doing it. And Ali's always has a bias to action and things like this. Yeah, I think it's amazing. So your job really is to like mm. make sure money is coming into this, this yeah. business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 is that right <laughs> yeah it's it's fine i'm kind of laughing because i i was filling in a form the other day it was like occupation i was like i don't, I don't know <laughs> like general manager but general manager of like a media company of like i, I don't know it's, it's really hard to succinctly say what i do yeah um what are the other revenue streams that you've got going on mm-hmm. that you're managing day to day um so, I mean, course, we kind of split the business into content and commercial teams. Mm-hmm. And the commercial side is, at the moment, mainly PTYA. And that's currently generating around 150, 200k a month, which is really good. And then the other side of the, of the company is the content arm. Mm-hmm. And so on YouTube, we've obviously got AdSense and sponsors. Yeah. Same with Deep Dive, the podcast, AdSense and sponsors. Um, and then sponsors across social media and the newsletter um and then affiliate revenue which is it's not too bad it's about sort of 10k a month so yeah. it's it's reasonable um those are kind of the the main ones there's nothing else that's kind of a, a major revenue driver um p2a has always been for the last like three years sort of 50 to 60 percent sometimes 70 percent of our revenue in the early stages and that's why we're trying to sort of diversify away from that over the next three to six months um but yeah content side of the business generates about 40 45 percent and then commercial team about 55, 60%. Yeah. And um, those other revenue streams, how would they, how would they break down there? Are they all roughly the same, like 10, 20, 30K a month? Yeah. So YouTube AdSense, like main channel is about 50K a month. Mm. And then sponsors, it really does range from about, depending on how many videos, Ali films, <laughs> uh, about 50K to 100K a month, mm-hmm. really, really depending on how many videos we've done. Um, Deep Dive AdSense is around 10K a month now. Um, and deep dive sponsors it's about it it really varies but like season to season it's between sort of 40 and 70k depending on how many sponsors we get Um, and so affiliates like 10k social media really does vary we kind of with social media sponsorships it's sort of if they come in and they fit we'll do them but we don't really have a target for that it's kind of an ad hoc thing and then newsletter is between 15 and 20k a month yeah what is your favorite of those other flavors is there any any, um, any of them that that's particularly good, good model? None that are kind of particularly unique. I wouldn't say. Um, I think the one that kind of I'm, I was going to say like most proud of, but it's not really proud, pride at all. But when we kind of we we took some of the partnerships in house in May of last year, and I was like, why don't we sponsor a newsletter? Like we haven't sponsored a new. Why don't we sponsor a newsletter? And now that's generating like twenty k a month, and I'm just like, oh, that's that's cool because that was kind of like something that. I took the initiative with and just sort of sorted and we hadn't been doing it before. Um, so that one I'm kind of like, I, I like kind of doing that one. Um, but sponsorships in general, I took those on sort of May last year and that's been probably one part of the job I find really enjoyable actually mm-hmm. because I've learned a lot just through doing. Um, and it's quite satisfying because you are essentially just agreeing deals of tens of thousands of pounds and negotiating and Ali's obviously in a position where given his size of audience, you're kind of already negotiating from a position of strength, yeah. which is really helpful. Um, so that's probably the one I have most enjoyment from. Um, How should a creator think about managing sponsorships? Oh, that's a good question. Doing them. Do you do, are they all inbound? Are they, do you do outbound stuff? Like what's the, I think you think kind of long-term? Yeah. I, so we don't work with anyone that Ali doesn't use. Mm-hmm. Um, that's like a kind of hard and fast rule. And, Ali's also trying to implement a new rule, which I'm pushing back against. It's like no deadlines as well, because we want to make sure we have as much creative freedom as possible. In terms of like outbound, inbound, again, because of 
Ali's side, we get a lot of inbound and we already have a lot of like existing relationships. I think one thing which I don't necessarily see a lot of creators doing or a lot of kind of smallish creators doing is they see kind of deals um, kind of in isolation. Mm-hmm. I think what we've done quite well is, or I hope I've done well, is building up relationships with brands uh, over time. And so that might mean sort of somewhat... Um, you know, losing money in the first few deals because you want to price it such that they do get reward from it. And we can build up a relationship that lasts over time rather than quoting something that's, you know, really good for you on the first deal. Yeah. Invariably, you under deliver and they either don't want to come back or the next deal is much, much lower. So I think it's like relationship building is a massive part of it. Um, And that's probably the one area that I see creators don't do enough. But in terms of like outbound stuff, I learned a lot from a guy called Justin Moore, mm-hmm. um, sponsorship coach on on Twitter. Yeah, um, really nice guy, and has given a lot of like time and, and space to to me, which I really appreciate. And he's kind of his course and going through that was really really useful. Um, and immediate, I, I think it's the other thing is like creators sometimes don't invest in the right places. Mm-hmm. But something like that course like that, you kind of get immediate ROI because yeah. if you implement the stuff from that, you immediately make the money back on the course. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Yeah, all of those things really, but relationships is one of the one of the key things I've kind of learned from from doing that. And how would you you said like make sure they get value, but how do you track that that they are getting value? Do you ask for it's, the numbers? It's like, very you, tricky. It's yeah. it's tricky. Uh, it's one thing that I could do better at, to be fair. Um, and one of the reasons, like it it, it could be a full time job. Mm-hmm. Like you could have a partnership manager that's a full time job, and if I had more time, I would kind of be more across the tracking and things like that. Yeah. But given the size of team and thing and stuff, we just operate as, as as well as we can. And so we track numbers on our side and discuss with the brands like how it's performed and things like that. Um, so it's a case, again, it comes back to the relationship side of things because some brands are willing to share numbers, yeah. some are more hesitant and things like that. So some would share them on the Zoom call but not actually share them with you. It's just, yeah. What would be like a, your favorite type of deal to do if someone's watching this, listen to this? <laughs> What do you like? They they come in, they do like the YouTube channel and the newsletter, like I, yeah. five videos. Package they... dealers are always package yeah. deals are always great. Um and probably I kinda like working on like three to six months. Anything longer than six months we generally steer away from because it's just it's just a risk basically, because mm-hmm. if Ali's channel takes off, suddenly we've agreed to a fee of, I don't know, fifteen K and now we're charging thirty K for everyone else, it's like you're yeah. Yeah. What would I be looking at? What What would I be looking at if I want to sponsor Ali's, Ali's videos? Ali's videos. Yeah. Um. So Ali's like main channel is twenty k um, per video. Yeah, per video. Um. And with different brands, we have different arrangements and things like that. And then if we, people want to sponsor multiple videos, we do discounts and packages and things mm-hmm. like that. But the package deals are always the ones that I prefer doing because it does mean one, you're working with the brand across multiple different streams. So if something doesn't perform well in this area, you can yeah. be like, okay, well, we can mix something up over here or add something extra in here if that's the case um and two it's just if you're doing it over multiple months you just again you build up that relationship um what about the newsletter if i want to sponsor the newsletter what am i looking at do i have to sign up to do five as five up five uh editions like no, how much does that it, cost? it's that's that's probably the only one that i am like one edition is kind of fine if people mm-hmm. want to sponsor that um but currently that's like because it's grown so much over the last like few year few months that's at 5k now i started off like at three three and a half but it's doubled in size. Five K, and you reach a hundred thousand people. So the newsletter has about three hundred eighty thousand people. Wow! And then the open rate averages around forty five percent. Yeah, so you're reaching. So we're reaching about one hundred fifty, two hundred people, yeah. two hundred thousand people. And that's a um, weekly. Weekly. You can use yeah. That. Yeah. Um, how How many people work on the newsletter? Um, one. One. So it's, that, again, that's a pretty profitable. Yeah. Revenue stream. And to be honest, it's even less than that now because Ali's kind of there was a period revealing the secrets now um where ali wasn't writing it um and we had a like, someone in the team was writing yeah. it and ali was checking it and stuff like that but now he is actually gone back to writing it again That's because he wants to have that outlet yeah um so in essence now in terms of putting the newsletter together someone like just gets it ready for ali on convert kit obviously i'm doing the sponsorship beforehand and getting that all ready so it's like I, I guess it's sort of two or three of us each having some sort of hand in it but mm-hmm. no one's just working on the newsletter anymore yeah the last one of those is the podcast, mm. which in a way feels like the strangest one to me because I know podcasts are a lot of work, um, especially to get off the ground, get mm. going. What was the thinking behind that? And is that now like a profitable thing for you as well? Yeah. Um, 
so the thinking behind it was here we start we started thinking about it in start of 2021 um and essentially thinking about it from a place of you know at the moment we've got like one asset in terms of the main channel and the podcast it, the podcast is something which we knew would do well because we'd sort of validated it to a certain extent by Ali doing he did these deep dive interviews during lockdown mm-hmm. um and we had a fair few people on they were just live streams on youtube i think they're still available people like ryan holiday brandon sanderson like loads of people were yeah. on those ones um and we were like this is clearly like a thing that we mm. could develop further um and yeah so for, start of 2021 we started kicking the idea around and then when after we recorded a couple of of, of interviews we realized actually this needs someone to stop we need someone full-time on this yeah um so we employed someone about two years ago in august um and she's just taken it and we run with it and we launched the first season september 2021 and we're now in season five or six um and over time ali's kind of waxed and waned on his enthusiasm for it yeah. if i'm being completely honest sometimes he's like ah oh, I don't know why we're doing this. But other times he's like, oh, this is really good. But in terms of like the intangible benefits he's had from it and we've had from it as a business, it's like unparalleled really. Like the network that Ali's got as a result of doing it, um, like the work we've done with Daniel Priestley alone, mm-hmm. who came on the podcast this time last year, um, easily pays for the podcast in itself. Um, and if I'm honest, I see it as, as an incredible asset for the business moving forward and something which... I could see a world in which it becomes more important than the main channel, for sure. Because in like 10 years time, Ali will probably still want to be talking to interesting people. Yeah. Will he still want to be making videos about productivity? I don't know. Maybe. But I can see him more being like Tim Ferriss and like wanting to just to kind of talk to interesting people and do that kind of life. Yeah. And so I think the the podcast definitely has a lot of potential. Um, What's the stuff you did with Daniel Priestley off the back of it? So I mean he's he's come in and done coaching sessions with the whole team, um, um, connected me with his like COO and had some sessions with her and it's just a lot of stuff. He's been very kind of open and willing to to help because he can see a lot of uh, potential in you know these creative businesses. Yeah, he's just he's just a really good, really nice guy, really genuine yeah. um, and incredible value not only from his books obviously that we'd got already but um, just from talking to him and and really sort of changing the way we thought about the business. Uh, especially in terms of the size of the team um, and what he said made us realize the mistake we made when we hired everyone. Um, so, yeah. Which was? Which was we hired too many people. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, essentially um, what what he says is, you know, companies go from sort of um, a lifestyle business up to like 12 people and then beyond 12, you enter into the desert where you're like too big to be small and too small to be big. Until you get to 40, you're in that kind of desert period. And once you get to 40, usually the systems are locked in and you're kind of entering performance-based business territory. And we kind of gone into the, that sort of desert territory and got to 19 people. And that's essentially what we started to struggle with, lines of communication, with output slowing, and then um, expenses going up, revenue going down, not going down, but like drying up. Um and so we just realized that, like, although we thought we were the only ones to have ever done this, it was just, like, oh, this is a com- mistake that most companies make. They just overhire when they start to when they start to expand, as we did in 2021. Um, and so, yeah, it was just interesting to kind of have that, what we had done, validated to a certain extent. Yeah. Let's talk about that as well, because I think that's the other thing about the whole YouTuber space is it's very easy to make the video like we made four million last year doing mm. free things. But yeah. what's the what are the hard, what have been the hardest moments working in this business? Hardest moments. Um I think hmm, a a couple of times. Um so I mean one was yeah, we we hired eight people in September of twenty twenty one. We went up to nineteen people at one point. Uh and then middle of last year we uh, were kind of at a size that was just not sufficient, uh, not sustainable, sorry. Um, and so we had to sort of let five people go, absolutely nothing wrong with their performance at all. It was just a case of, you know, we didn't have the space, essentially. Um, and it wasn't sustainable for us. And at the time, it kind of coincided with one of the cohorts of P2A kind of underperformed for us. And so we were like, we've got revenue potentially drying up from cohorts there's like a recession on the horizon our expenses are going up 
like we need to do something um and we yeah. need to cut back a bit yeah exactly um so that was that was really difficult obviously f- again i whenever i talk about this i'm always like far more difficult for the guys affected but yeah. um that was that was tricky um and but again i think they're all succeeding now in their own freelance stuff i think to be honest that's probably the hardest one there's like micro stresses uh, and things like that especially with managing so many people and learning how to do that effectively there's always like a new challenge every day yeah. and keeping across everything can be stressful um i don't really like switch off because mm-hmm. i need to be on most of the time <laughs> or unless i feel like i do maybe i don't um and so yeah that's probably, that was probably the hardest thing uh, everything else has not been a smooth rider by any stretch of the imagination but nothing's been sort of as momentous as that yeah how do you um that, that's such an interesting thing as well right because how do you how do you manage the team size when you're spitting out mm. significant profit and how do you have like hard conversations when people can say well why are you getting rid of us we're making 1.5 million 2 million a year mm. doesn't make any sense um yeah it's it, it's hard um i think ali's always had again fairly arbitrary but like 60 percent operating profit as mm-hmm. his benchmark for what he kind of wants um to achieve each year and, and for the last like couple of years that's also somewhat equated with around two million um and essentially anything that sort of threatens that to a certain extent is like our break even almost it's yeah. like oh we actually need to start taking action because otherwise we're going to fall below that that yeah. threshold and yes there's an element well very strong elements which that's completely arbitrary um but ultimately as with a lot of things in the in this business like ali runs the business and his nail above the door this is his call on certain things like this um so yeah there, there is it is difficult but at the same time do you need to run it from a place of like actually we want to make sure we are building and we are sustainable for the next three, five, six years rather than the next six to 12 months. Um, and it's something we're thinking about literally at the moment when we're thinking, oh, we need to hire more people. But then we're like, actually, we've just finished cohorts. We haven't developed the next product yet with this in development. Um, we need to sort of, the hiring strategy that we want to adopt moving forward is make the money first, then hire. Yeah. And in the past, we've gone with hiring in an expectation or anticipation of making money. And that's when it's kind of fallen down. Yeah. What's your relationship like with him? Have you ever fallen out? Yeah. yeah. What's the relationship like? And I'm curious as well, because you are the general manager of this mm. 5 million a year business. Mm. You're 27 years old. Was there a, ever a moment where this role came up and he said, actually, I'm thinking of going to bring someone in from out of house? Yeah. Um, with like 10, 15 years experience working at some some kind of similar business. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Two both very interesting questions. Um, so in terms of our relationship, yeah, we have a, it's, it's very weird. We're, we're very much kind of somewhat opposite personalities. Mm-hmm. <laughs> similar in the sense of like, we're both very perfectionist and driven and kind of just always on and stuff like that. But opposite in the sense of like, he's very creative. I'm very like kind of quite logical and mm-hmm. uh, systematic um and we do like it's quite funny some people like comment when they see us like arguing it's like you guys argue all the time it's like well yeah but ali likes pushback he Uh likes getting into arguments he kind of gets a kick out of (laughs) Mm -hmm. of arguing um and so i think one of the reasons we've kind of worked so well together is because we have that back and forth i'm not afraid to push back on stuff that he says and vice versa um and so that's kind of why that's worked so well we are kind of so so opposite but, what would you push back on? I mean, if he has ideas that aren't, you know, going to... I'm trying to think of an example now, but sometimes he'll come up with an idea and say, oh, we can do that. And I'm like, yeah, we, we could if we had, like, an extra team member. But, like, yeah. this person is already at capacity. They're doing this, yeah. this, and this. And he's like, yeah, but surely they can just do this in, like, half an hour. I'm like, no, that would take, like, a week. Mm-hmm. And sometimes his sort of dial of how long things take is very much dialed to how, how quickly he could do it rather yeah. than how quickly the normal person could do, could yeah. do it. Um, so it's things like things like that. And also kind of high level business stuff around like what pro- projects should we move forward and things like that. Like for example, he wants to kickstart the vlog again at the moment. Um, so I push back quite heavily on that, but he's, we, we're going to do it as an experiment, but we'll see where, how that Steven's goes. doing doing his. Well, yes, pretty, <laughs> pretty, pretty much. Um, it's, it's, yeah. Coincidentally, that idea came about a week after Steven released his first video, but um <laughs> Yeah, um, there, there is sometimes that element of 
of this person's doing it, therefore. But he's like the the visionary and yes. you're the... Yeah. What's this? Is it from this book? In three years, traction. traction. Traction, yeah. That sort of, we read that in... 2021 which is sort of the best and worst thing that's happened to the business mm-hmm. well not really worst at all but like it was that that got us under sort of org, de- org charts and org design which then made us think oh crap angus is sitting in nine different seats therefore we need to hire for eight different people yeah and in reality we needed to hire for like three or four different people right. because it's kind of fine in a startup if you're sitting in two three different roles and mm-hmm. wearing multiple hats um but no that that was that book's been like very useful for us in terms of transforming our thinking around the business and yeah you're right there's this sort of visionary integrator relationship um and there's another book off the back of traction called rocket fuel and we that's literally about the visionary integrator relationship and in there there's there's a there's a table which has like the two characteristics mm-hmm. of each per- person visionary integrator and like when we were going down it was like that's me that's ali that's me that's ali that's me that's ali like just so it's one the ideas person one's the the, yeah in the get shit done yeah pretty pretty much um but even like beyond because there are some things that were broken down even further than that and it's like oh my god this could have been like just written to describe the two of us um so yeah like that's been that's uh, that relationship has has worked very well i can't remember the second part the second bit was did you ever apply for the role and did did Uh, ali ever think I should bring someone in for this. Yeah. And you've, you, yeah. This is where I, I do have to very much, um, you know, be, be grateful for, for Ali on, on this point, because in that period where we, when we were like at that, that time we were hiring loads of people, there was a general manager position. Advertised. Interesting. Um, and when it was advertised, like everything that was on the list, probably 80% of it, I felt I was like already doing. And so there was a period for about a month where Ali was like, oh, I want to get someone in who's got expertise. Like, I want to get an adult in the room because you and I are still so, like, pretty young. I mean, I was, like, 25. He was 27. Yeah. Um, which is kind of understandable, like, getting some experience. I can, I can understand that. But at the same time, my argument was, like, I'm already doing 80% of this. The 20% I can learn. He's seen what I can do over the last, like, 18 months. I'm not someone who just, you know, rests on my laurels with stuff. And eventually... After we, I mean, I'd even, I even interviewed three people for that role, yeah. um, which was a weird experience, but, um, eventually he was like, actually, yeah, I'll give it to you till the rest of the year and see how we go. Um, and did you, how did you broach that? Did you kind of like see it advertised and go, and then just be talking in your head to yourself for a while going, why is it, why is he advertised this thing? Why is he advertised this thing? Or did you? I was fairly away, vocal it, from the you? start. <laughs> yeah. I was fairly vocal from the start. Um, and even with like what one of the pe- people that applied for that and that we interviewed, I I now have like coaching sessions with, and she's become very like a, a good sort of, um, you know, person to sort of rest on for certain and ask for certain things as a kind of confidant for advice and coaching and things like that. Um, and I think that's I, I still think that's kind of the best approach that we've taken, and and developing people from within is very much kind of Ali's ethos. Um, yeah. And also what like, we've seen with. I know I've seen with like Mr. Beast's team and things like that, they've hired a number of people who've had corporate experience yeah. and they've like gone within six months yeah. because it's a very different world. Yeah. And so I think personally, I still think it would have been a mistake if we'd hired someone with 10 years experience in the corporate world to come and run the business because I think it's so different to anything else. Um, how, do you, how do you generally hire people then now, nowadays? Because I, I think that's, that's so, what's something I've heard yeah. you... And Ali both talk about is like, what's the best way to figure out if you've got good people? It's it's really tricky. Um, I think one thing that we've definitely learned over the last like few years is to hire the person rather than the CV. Mm-hmm. I think like I don't really for the last like few roles we've hired for at least in a freelance capacity haven't really looked at the CVs at all. I either looked at their child task or watched and or looked at their. We get everyone to like record a loom now, introducing like who they are what they why they've applied for the role like what experience they've had and you can tell so much from someone actually speaking for two minutes rather than reading through what they've done on a bit of paper for you know whatever um and that's been really useful a useful way for us to sort of really develop our out our system of of hiring um if it's a full-time role which we haven't actually hired for for a while and we have a much sort of more intensive round of interviewing and things like that um mainly taken from which we don't stick to religiously, but we probably should do the book um, "Who Method for Hiring" right. by Jeff Smart and someone else, um, and that that's really 
useful in how and really changed up how we think think about it um because that massive round of hiring we did in 2021 was it was it was good and to be fair like the people we hired were all very very good but we could have done that a lot better if we'd had the experience of knowing kind of what actually is the right thing to do and i think we got people to write cvs and cover letters for that for those roles i don't think we'd do that again now yeah that's interesting yeah i've i've definitely noticed that in my own hiring, I can tell so much just from the initial email they send. Yeah. Tends to be the people who wrote write the most coherent email with like answering free questions, yeah. follow through to the best task and the best candidates. Yeah. Um so do you set people you set people a couple of tasks, the yeah, so video you, and yeah. then like role dependent stuff. We always have like a trial task which for that first sort of round we is we try to make sure it's not too time intensive because we don't offer payment for the initial trial task and so it's usually anywhere between like 30 minutes to like a couple of hours mm -hmm. usually sometimes there's an edit which might take a bit longer and then we will for every round of hiring there will always be one person who applies being like i've not done my trial task because it's unfair that you're not paying for it <laughs> yeah and i'm like well fine but if you really want the role then yeah. you know yeah but that, that's just how it goes um and then we'd have another trial task and then for that second one, this is if we haven't whittled it mm -hmm. down far enough anyway. For that second one, we do we do pay. We don't want to ask people to do free stuff twice. Sure. Sure. Um, so we do pay for that. Um, and then after that, we'll go to a round of interviews. Um, at the moment, it's still like one-on-one, -on -one, but we have thought about doing group interviews moving forward mm -hmm. um, because we spoke to um, Dickie Bush, actually, mm -hmm. um, and they're using group interviews for some of their stuff now and said it's incredibly effective in terms of like, one, isolating the right people, but two, saving time as well. Last question on the hiring stuff. Do you um, hire freelance and then go to full time? Like, what's your what's your thoughts on that? Because I've heard you had a, a few different yeah. a few different iterations on that. Yeah, because that's how you started, right? Yeah, exactly. It's kind of constantly evolved. Um, I started freelance and then went to the full time. Same with um, Elizabeth. He started after me. It was always like freelance and contractor first. And then when we hired everyone, that big group of people, we just hired straight away full time. And I think that was that was a mistake because if we'd just hired freelance and contract, we probably would have identified earlier that actually we didn't need everyone. Um, so after we had sort of scaled the team back down, we kind of made the decision that we're not going to hire anyone full time for now. We're going to go back to hiring just, just freelance or just contractor. And if they're good enough, then we'll bring them on full time. Um, and now we're sort of still in that position to a certain extent, but where we do have particular needs. Very cool. Yeah. Cool. So obviously this whole business is fundamentally underpinned by YouTube. Mm. And certainly earlier on in your, in your role, you were doing script writing, all the rest yeah. of it. What is the 101 of YouTube? Oh. Becoming a YouTuber, getting good <laughs> at it. Yeah. Um that's a that's a, that's a that's a huge question. <laughs> um, there isn't necessarily anything that I can answer like in a sentence. I think I, I, what I can say is like over the past couple of years, one thing that we've increasingly realised, which you know is kind of basics, um, is the importance of like packaging, mm -hmm. titles and thumbnails, uh, just so important. And so we do that before anything else. I think in terms of like a framework for for YouTubers, one of the one of the things that Ali likes to talk about is kind of the three stages of starting on YouTube. There's a kind of level one is get going, where you are just literally making videos and trying to get into the habit of making videos. Level two is um, get good, where you're trying to like optimize stuff. And level three is get smart. And it's in that kind of switch between getting good and getting smart that you kind of start to see from a hobby to a business. You actually start to see it as something which can generate income and generate revenue. In terms of, yeah, in terms of like the 101 mm -hmm. of like how to start on YouTube, then it's really important to actually nail down your niche and talk specifically to someone a, at a particular audience. It doesn't, there's so many different niches on YouTube. I'm always astounded when I come across a channel with like, I don't know, millions of subscribers I've just never heard of. And it's in a completely really weird random niche. Um, but you don't need a massive audience to be able to kind of make a living from it. You know, we've seen examples of people easily making six figures from like, 10,000 subscribers, that kind of thing. Um, and Who would that be? Like a coach or something like that? Yeah, so coaching is one thing, but also just if it's a very specific 
like for example we there's a guy called august bradley who makes videos about notion mm -hmm. and he created a cohort based course around the same time that we did back in 2020 and he had about 20,000 subscribers. Yeah. And it made over a million dollars. Wow. In like two or three cohorts. With 5,000 subscribers. 20,000. 20,000 yeah. subscribers, so. And even now he's only got about 60,000, but he easily makes a living from just that number. So I think it's it's all about like identifying what your value proposition is, i.e. what your niche really is, and then who you're trying to speak to. Like if you've got those two right, and then you do appropriate sort of competitor analysis, which can be as, as deep or as surface as you really want it to go, and then package the video correctly, then you should and and consistency over time, um, you should you, you should succeed. But nothing is guaranteed, really, on YouTube. Yeah, it's super interesting. You say you do the packaging first, so you do the title and the thumbnail. So yeah, with Ali's channel, how does that work? Does he basically have have a notion, or does he just say I'm thinking about a video on productivity, and then yeah. you come up with it? How does how does that? Yeah, work? so we have um, we do everything in Notion and. Um, we have just a Kanban board and then we have sort of a column of ideas and then when Ali and the YouTube producer will decide like what the videos want to kind of move forward and they'll go into sort of title, thumbnail and hook column and then Tintin who's the YouTube producer will um, create a title, create a thumbnail, create the hook for this video then it will go forward to like Ali's input side of things. Once Ali's decided whether he can just record it then or it needs more writing then it will either go into like filming or writing. But the title and the thumbnail and the hook all come first, like we, before we even get onto any of the detail around like how we're going to expand this concept or talk about the concept in any way, it needs to have good packaging. Because fundamentally, like the YouTube algorithm, people kind of see it as like a machine, but yeah. it's fundamentally driven by people Yeah. because people will click on your videos. And if your video is incredible in terms of it's like how it's filmed, how it's edited, it's not going to do well if it's got like a shit title and a shit thumbnail. Yeah. What's the hook when you say the hook? Is that like the first, first thing he says? Like 10, 30, 10 to 30 seconds. Um, we have that scripted out. And with those ideas, like, do they come from Ali? Like, what's it, what, what's the rough it's combination one? of, like, Ali himself, um, other team members, like, throwing stuff in, mm -hmm. or whether we've seen another video do well in another niche, um, or another, even, even in the same niche, but, like, packaged differently, or, like, that sort of thing. And we just fill that column with, like, there's hundreds of ideas in there. Yeah. And what's the fundamental of a good hook? It, um, out, outlying a problem or like what's that? It, it really kind of, it really varies because there's different ways of doing it. It's either kind of like how you might set up a problem like um, verbally or it could just be how you're editing the video as well. Um, we've tried various different things. Um, to be honest, like our retention is not great, but it's when you look at like the experts, I guess, on YouTube, um, you only got to watch the sort of the first five seconds of their five to ten seconds of their video to see just how much is going on. Mm -hmm. I think it's all about keeping attention. Like in this, we we kind of are operating in a, a kind of a world which is so driven by attention more than anything else. And so anything that you can do in the first five to ten seconds to keep that attention and hold that attention and draw yeah. people into the video, there isn't any, like a perfect formula for a perfect hook. But anything you can do to to maximize the attention after the first 10 seconds is so crucial. That's like where the 80-20 of doing, of making good YouTube video is getting good thumbnail, getting good title and doing good decent hook. Yeah. The rest of the video can be not average, but like you don't have to put as much thought into the rest of the video if you get those three bits right. Um, obviously we do, but you know, it's one of those things, it's like that is where you need to be spending most of your time. Yeah. How do you guys think about shorts? Is that, you, 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 yeah. you've done quite a bit of that, quite a bit of them on the channel. Yeah, it took us a while. Um, because we were always quite skeptical of them up until YouTube separated videos and shorts in the feed. I think up until that point, one of the issues I'd always had with them is just like, it's just going to it's going to make the feed look rubbish. Yeah. Um, but when they separated them, then it was like, okay, actually this is something we should, we should do. And we do think more strategically about shorts, like exactly what Ali needs to say and exactly what seems to like keep audience attention slash perform better. And there are various different words and phrases and things like that, that we found work, work well for his stuff. Um, and certain types of videos, like there's the series of like effects that Ali's done, you know, like psychological effects, those kind of things that yeah. perform really well. The Dr. Julie yeah, kind of exactly. yeah, school of... Um, and we sort of stumbled upon an editing style that has now become kind of unique for the channel. Yeah. Um, and like pe people know the channel for the editing style of the yeah. shorts. And that was, that was actually somewhat accidental. Um, one of our editors who we have through an agency and we've had her for like the last year, mm -hmm. 
sort of started editing them like that. Yeah. And we're like, oh, this is working quite nicely. Um, and so now we hire editors for shorts if they can edit in that style. And it's yeah, it's become like a trademark of the, of do the you, channel. Do you have a similar approach there where like you have a, is the, you start with the title and the hook? Or? No, not, not as much. That That's just a case of um, kind of idea and script. And like, we don't, we kind of probably throw out more stuff from shorts, but there's not the same scrutiny over a title and thumbnail as there is for other stuff. Um, apart from, but there is as much scrutiny over the hook, but not the title and thumbnail. How much of those ideas are original and how much do you take inspiration from other people? Uh, for the shorts? Yeah. <laughs> I suppose Hard general question as well for the YouTube, but I that's yeah. one thing I see, you do see on YouTube and on shorts. I think more so on shorts is like the same ideas kind of roughly... I think for, for some things, it's, especially in the productivity space, it is difficult sometimes to be Original, yeah. novel and unique. Yeah. Um, however, we do try to make sure that potentially the packaging is different or like, when I say packaging, I mean sort of delivery, especially in shorts, like delivery and the editing yeah. and things like that. I think with a lot of stuff we do on shorts, it's, it's fairly unique. Um, I think in terms of the packaging on the main channel, yes, there is definitely inspiration taken from other people um it's like there's loads of other videos that you can draw exact comparisons with the thumbnails that we've created yeah. and yours definitely get ripped off a lot yeah well. yeah well, yeah See? It's, yeah it's it's, it's a two-way street like the video that ali released a couple of weeks ago that the book one someone did a thread on twitter basically saying um because uh, everyone's five, done that yeah one. exactly yeah, yeah. everyone everyone's done that one and it's like well yeah but it it works and everyone's doing it slightly differently yeah. everyone's got their is saying something different in the video so you know why not and i remember a couple of years ago when ali's like passive income video took off it's like the first one we'd use the icons and then suddenly yeah. within like a month everyone was using the icons yeah. um so all of these things kind of go go round and it swings and roundabouts like you know it's like austin cleon says like still like an artist so you, you kind of take some inspiration from other people they take inspiration from you it's just like we don't really have a problem with anyone copying our thumbnails and I don't think anyone should really. I think that's it. As long as you've got a uni unique take. Yeah. Um, I know there's a lot of channels that just translate to a different language. Like yeah. the Mr. Beast in Russia and stuff like that. That's maybe a little bit different, but yeah, <laughs> yeah there's there's like so sort of taking inspiration and there's then there's plagiarism. Yeah. <laughs> which is a different level. Let's let's wrap up with some slightly quicker fire yeah. questions. Um top three books. Oh. Um uh I need to go through all of them now. Depends. Depends what for. Maybe for give give us give us give us one one for, one or two for the business side and one or two personal side. So one that Ali always recommends, which I also think is great, is the E Myth Revisited. Mm -hmm. um, that's like a great, very quick but very useful read. Um, and then Hundred Million Dollar Offers by Alex Hormozzi. Mm -hmm. um, and then I assume Hundred Million Dollar Leads, which is coming out tomorrow as we film. Um, I expect that will be equally as good, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Probably that as well. Um, and then in terms of like the management side um, and kind of running of the business side, uh, two that I've read this year, which I think are really, really good. One is um, It Doesn't Have to Be Crazy at Work by mm -hmm. the two founders of a company called Basecamp. Again, quite a quick read, very short chapters, but really, really good. Um, really questioning the kind of age-old tropes of running a business in corporate life and things like that. Um, very, very good, that one. And then in terms of like managing and managing people, Multipliers was another book where I was like, oh, I've been doing a lot of stuff wrong. Um, and there's a lot of stuff I could improve. Um, so those two on sort of the management side. Who are the the three, well, two or three creators who you look at and you like really admire what they're building? Um, I think... I think I admire the approach that the Hormozis are taking with like how they're offering stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously you can, yes, they've got a massive uh, kind of um, amount of wealth anyway, so they can afford to give away stuff for free and that kind of thing. But I do, I do like their general approach and the amount of value they do give out for free is pretty incredible mm -hmm. um, on YouTube and stuff. And they're clearly leaning into that more. Um, in terms of sort of like YouTube stuff and, and, building a creative business. The the stuff that Steven's doing with Dara CEO is particularly interesting. Um, I'm kind of still fascinated by by what 20 or 30 people or whatever he's, however many people he's employed now yeah. do on the podcast. Yeah. And 
somewhat intrigued by what he wants from that and what his aim is. Yeah. I still think I'm still not entirely sure where he's going with that. Yeah. But I'm intrigued. Yeah. Um, and I think the attention to detail that they have with everything they do, um, which I kind of read a bit about in Ali had like an advanced copy of his book and he breaks down a bit of what they do for the podcast in that. It's just crazy amount of detail yeah. that they go to. Um, Grace is Grace's head of marketing is going to come on this podcast yeah. and tell us everything. So yeah, so I'd be intrigued to to know and listen to that. Um, yeah, I've, always, I've I've followed her stuff for a while. I'm intrigued by by what they what what, what they're trying to build over there. Yeah. Um, interested to see like his those episodes starting to appear on iPlayer and things like that. So it's from that perspective, I'm intrigued by what he's trying to merge like traditional and new media. Yeah. And what the aim is with that. Um, so yeah, that's and then. I'm just generally intrigued by, even though it's a completely different niche, by the kind of physical product side of things as well. Like what Mr. Beast has done and then not done with some of his products, the issues he's had around like Beast Burger and then also what KSI and Logan Paul have done with Prime. Just from like a, just a purely business perspective of that kind of thing. Like I don't really follow their content at all. Yeah. But it's intriguing to see how they're leveraging their audiences. Um, yeah, for... for yeah, it's in, and the Mr. Beast stuff is, is interesting just in terms of how that's how that's failed with the Beast Burger stuff. Yeah, that's a super interesting business to look into, that business that they partnered with. Side note. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that kind of comes on to maybe the last question, which is what what's next for you, you guys? Because mm -hmm. you've obviously, have you had the last cohort of that? Yeah. It feels like there's like a much bigger play now yeah. with everything you're doing, like maybe on the productivity side. Mm. I don't know if you're working on an app or something around that or physical product, yeah. but it definitely feels like there's another level, a whole other level, which a little bit, maybe not quite the same mm. level as Prime, yeah, <laughs> but, no, but, quite, but but like there, there's definitely for sure a lot, lot further to go. Yeah, yeah, no one, um, it's it's essentially, we, we, are, we are looking into the productivity space. Um, Fundamentally, Ali is not known for helping people make YouTube videos, even though P2I has been very successful and people have succeeded off the back of it. Like his content is about productivity and productivity is such a huge space. His book, which is coming out in December, is focused on productivity. So that is the next sort of area of the arc of the business. We haven't exactly worked out what that will look like at the moment. We have got physical products in development, uh, which is going to be a different brand. Um, so hopefully somewhat distancing Ali from you know, the actual revenue. Sure. Um, the app kind of idea has been floated around, but the issue, the, the kind of issue with the app is just it's going to require a lot of investment and it's going to require a lot of time to get right. Because mm. I think if we do it, we want to make sure it's not just another creator app that's yeah. got Ali's name on it. We yeah. want it to actually be really good mm. and like rival productivity apps rather yeah. than just be another creator in the marketplace. Um, but yeah, in terms of sort of what our, our next sort of, you know, Peter Way was obviously such a big thing and the last cohort did like $2 million. And so that's a that's a amount of money that we won't have next year. And so it's thinking about how can we offset that and, and do more. And the productivity space is just so much bigger than people wanted to make YouTube videos. Yeah. Um, about 4,000 people have gone through PTYA. There's far more than 4,000 people who want to become more productive. And so now it's over the next like couple of months, it's just a case of working out exactly what that product and that offering is and what Ali wants to kind of be in that space because he can own, he could, he can own that. Yeah. And the book is definitely a brand builder for that. Um, and so, yeah, the next six to 12 months are quite exciting in that sense because that sort of vertical of the business we haven't explored at all. And that sort of total addressable market for productivity is just huge. Mm -hmm. um, the one con issue we have with that is that sometimes if something is so big, you can, make something that appeals to everyone, appeals to no one. Yeah. So we do need to kind of be mindful of that. But if we do it right, then it could, yeah, take the business from five to 10 million next yeah. year. Feels like software is like a, a, an interesting place to, to, to explore. Yeah, I think I think software, if we, if we went down that route, then we would probably look to develop something that could then, because we developed an app that was, that was very good and wasn't necessarily tied to Ali's name. It suddenly becomes a sellable asset as well. And we can't sell anything that we currently do because yeah. everything's tied to Ali. Yeah. So it's looking at things like that as well and thinking how do we make this business sustainable by potentially creating products and assets that we might sell further down the line. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting, but equally somewhat daunting because we're kind of in that transition period 
where I'm looking at our accounts being like, well, it's looking really good at the moment, but in a year's time, if we haven't sort of filled the gap of the cohort, then it could be very different. Um, so, yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Angus, for dropping no by. I absolutely loved it. it yeah. Amazing. I think there's so much knowledge in there, so many gems in there. Nice. Um, and I hope everyone listening or watching found it useful. Yeah, hope so too. Thanks very much. Nice one.